Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Allison Kurt, and welcome to the 2021 PGA Merchandise Show Virtual Experience and Marketplace. I am very excited to be presenting in this platform and talking to you about the performance of golf. Maybe some of you have seen me in person live at the different um, merchandise shows and presenting about golf and psychology. And certainly during our current climate, it's such a fascinating opportunity to be able to reach on even a global market talking about golf and psychology and the performance of golf. So I'm really honored to be presenting to you today and hopefully you'll be able to pick up some new things that will help not only you as a player and a professional in your field, but your students as well. So today what we're gonna talk about is the big five in sports psychology. And these are the basic fundamentals of how your brain and mind need to be organized and performing in order to shoot your best scores, reach your goals, and optimize your performance. If you think about the fundamentals in golf, like grip, alignment, and posture, this is the fundamentals in sport psychology. These are the things that you really wanna build a solid foundation for you and your students in order to regulate your emotions and be able to overcome obstacles that come up in your way or hitting a bad shot, how to recover and to allow yourself to persevere through the struggles that certainly golf brings us. So our focus today is to cover each of these elements one by one, give you some tools and how to implement it and give you just a really solid foundation so that you can share with your students moving forward. To give you a brief background of myself, I'm a PGA Master Professional and an LPGA Master Professional. I do have my doctorate in clinical psychology with a concentration in sports psychology. And some of you may know my story, you've seen me present before or know me personally, but really as I started to involve myself in the golf industry and kind of found what my niche was, I found myself really working with students outside and having such pleasure in learning about their personal lives and what motivated them, what drove them, and what are the things that kind of threw them off and dysregulated them. And so I started to conceptualize this idea of working with students from the inside out, not just working with students from the outside in. Of course, it was very rewarding and fruitful to help a student reduce their slice or to shoot a career low, but to actually perform and to manage the things, the baggage that they have in their world to be able to persevere on the golf course was very rewarding for me. So as I worked my way through becoming a teacher and, and really building my coaching business, I went to grad school and earned my doctorate in psychology and became a licensed therapist in the state of California. Not only a marriage and family therapist, but a clinical professional counselor, which gave me the privilege and the license to work with students on the clinical aspects that they might have been suffering from that can deter them from their performance, things such as anxiety or trauma and depression, or even relationships as it becomes with caddy player or parent and junior golfers. And so it allowed me to have a solid foundation to work with students from the inside out and to understand how their brains were operating and the different things that came in their life, how they were able to manage that in order to perform their best. Certainly I've been very rewarded from the PGA and the LPGA with some nice teaching awards, and it's allowed me the privilege to be able to share my information with you here today. As we look at the big five in sports psychology, the foundations are regulating emotions. And I put that at the top because it's so important because emotions just aren't reactionary, but emotions can be looked at as being constructed. And how we respond to our emotions can make or break the score on the next hole. How we respond to our emotions can impact the interactions that we have with a member at our club or a potential um, business partner. So looking at emotional regulation, I think first and foremost kind of sets the stage for the rest of the big five in sports psychology. We go into attention and concentration next. And in our current climate with so many different things going on from politics to health and fitness to technology, our attention and concentration is being hijacked constantly. 
So to have a nice afternoon on the golf course and to be able to be one with ourselves and our friends and our uh, facilities and our environment can sometimes be difficult because we're pulled in so many different directions from attention and concentration. So we're gonna learn how to build that and make that better. Next, we'll go into goal setting. If you don't have a template and you don't have a plan, how do you know where you're supposed to go? Whether it's a lesson goal, whether it is a five-year goal on how to become the best club player someone can be, or whether it's a big goal for yourself, how to be the best teacher you can be, we need to have a roadmap. And so that does influence our motivation when we look at goal setting. Next, we'll go into imagery, visualization, and mental practice. It's amazing what we see in our mind, what we believe in our mind, how we rehearse certain things can really turn our reality into a successful, successful opportunity. So seeing ourselves perform and preparing ahead of time mentally can enhance the performance of golf. And lastly, touching the emotional aspect of the big five of sports psychology is our self-talk. The things that we say to ourselves how that turns into our belief system and how that translates into our reality. And some of you know that you can be really tough critics on yourself and that may play out in being tough critics for other people. So to have compassion and empathy for ourselves and learn how the way that we talk to ourselves can either hold us back or allow us to shine and move forward. So let's get started. What are emotions? I look at emotions as being purely information. So as we're experiencing something, as we're experiencing an event, maybe laughing with a friend or seeing a really scary movie, our body is taking the outside environment and it's constructing a picture in our brain of what this means and, and results, uh, the emotions result. And so from the emotion, we then start to apply meaning to what that outside environment is. So what I mean is if we're watching a scary movie and we see these images on a movie screen that seem frightening, our body will start to pick up the sensory of what fear is. Maybe the hair on the back of your neck starts to spring up or your heart starts to pound a little bit more. And maybe even the amygdala in your brain starts to get taxed into that fear center and then the connections in our neurons in our brain starts to create the sensation of fear. Now, what's really interesting about this information of emotion is what we do with it and how we interpret it can impact the performance. Because emotions are just not reactionary. So watching a scary image for me may bring up fear, but watching a scary image from a different person's perspective might actually bring up laughter. So it's not reactionary, but it can actually be constructed. And when I use the word constructed, it means that we can be in control of our emotions. We can sort of determine when we have information coming into our body, how we want to respond. So I want you to take a look at this video here and imagine what you might be feeling if you were this little guy coming into golf learning the game, starting out with a success, getting real close to the hole, feeling like, yeah, I'm gonna take on the world. So emotions of confidence and courageousness and an excitability to learn. And then maybe getting a sense of, okay, let's go ahead, let's see how good I can get. Oh no, the ball doesn't go in. And then the emotions result. We have a temper tantrum. Hopefully none of you have experienced this amount of an emotional response on the golf course. But you can imagine, so at this age, humans really don't have a good regulation system for handling emotions. But as adults, we have learned some skills along the way. We have learned some tricks on how to deal with emotions and not have a temper tantrum every time we miss an eight inch putt. So I want you to look at emotions as sort of the system of a shot occurs then a physical response results. So the act of missing the putt can create a physical response, maybe of a shoulders lowering or tension in the hands. That physical response then emotes an emotion. And so it could feel like frustration, it could feel like anger, it could feel like being disheveled. 
And then we have the interpretation. And the interpretation is really what sets the story. It can completely narrates the story. So if you have the sense of, oh gosh, here we go again. I've missed another putt. That will set you off on one particular path. Or if you miss the putt and you interpret, oh gosh, I'm just gonna be a little bit more focused on this next shot. Or the next time I get to um, eight inches away, I'll make sure that I mark it and breathe and kind of go through my pre-shot routine but I'm good enough. I'm not a bad putter. I'm good enough and I just missed a putt. Everything's gonna be okay. The interpretation can start to take the emotional level and bring it back to a nice baseline. Although emotions feel automatic, we have to remember that they're actually created and they're created by a pretty intricate system of neural connections in our brain. And we start to learn them over time. This little guy, as we saw in the video, if he cried like this every time he missed a putt, Sure enough, it's gonna feel automatic as he becomes a junior golfer. But if we can sort of nip it in the bud and take that system and say, you know what, when it comes to the emotion, let's go ahead and change the interpretation. Let's not carry out the script every single time that I miss a short putt, I'm going to be filled with anger and a temper tantrum. So instead of making predictions about how we're going to emote during a particular experience, why don't we just determine What's the best way for us to perform? Is it through anger? Is it through frustration? Or does it help and serve me better to maybe remain calm and to process through what happened and then to deal with it? In order to regulate emotions, we wanna look at developing self-awareness. So how does the emotion show up to you? Um, in a temper tantrum, does it come up in your chest? Or does it feel like you wanna shout and yell and break your putter? Um, are you sort of the quiet, mad golfer where you feel like you just want to shut down and close down? For the emotions that you experience on the golf course, it's really important that you determine how emotions show up in you so that you have a little bit of cues or triggers to be able to regulate that emotion moving forward. We want to be able to decrease. We want to decrease physical tension. We want to decrease heart rate. We want to decrease our availability to take in a whole bunch of information and become overwhelmed. Sometimes when we have a really broad vision, we wanna be able to make it a bit more narrow so we don't have so much stimulus coming in our brain. We wanna be able to decrease everything that gets really elevated and bring ourselves back to a nice baseline to perform. And lastly, we wanna be able to refrain. What does this mean for me? Just missing a putt. I'm still a good golfer. I'm not a bad person. I'm not going to lose the entire event because I missed this putt, but reframe the situation. Maybe the putter face was open. Maybe we weren't quite as focused. Something might have been distracting. Maybe I wasn't lined up correctly, but we don't always have to take the emotion and turn it into this is going to be a disastrous event. I'm going to fail. I'm never going to succeed. We can reframe it and turn it into a neutral experience and that's exceptionally helpful for us when we're trying to perform our best. Another helpful trick for regulating emotions is when you have the emotions and you feel it in your body, you can easily locate where the emotion is. Maybe it's in your chest, your shoulders, you hold your emotion in your jaws. Locate where the emotion is, identify it in your body. And then let's go ahead and work with that emotion. So create a shape for it. Perhaps it's a triangle, a circle a square, then let's assign a color to it. Blues and greens tend to be when you're kind of coasting along and making a few birdies and a few pars, orange and yellows and reds, those tend to come up a lot when we've just made a double bogey. Next, we're gonna name it. You can name it the emotion that you feel or you can give it any sort of name that fits you. But ultimately, when you can locate it in your body and you can shape it, you can color it and you can name it, you can now do something with it. You can own it. And by owning it, you can actually get rid of it, meaning you can get it out of your body through breath. So if I've just missed that short putt, instead of throwing that temper tantrum on the green, I can locate where that anger is and maybe there are little red triangles kind of hanging out in my chest and through a deep breath, I'm able to get all of that out of my body to prepare me for my next shot. Using some simple box breathing is also quite helpful when you're feeling some emotions that are really hard to 
contain. Maybe anxiety before you tee off on your first shot or anger because you've made a big score or you're playing really well and it's a really important tournament to you and you want to take the excitement and contain it. Box breathing is not only visually using a box to follow your breath, but also using a four count. So breathing in for four seconds, holding your breath for four seconds, exhaling for four seconds, and holding for four seconds. So imagine that someone has just cut you off in traffic and you're really upset and you'd like to bust your horn and flip them the bird and maybe yell at them. Before you do any of that, see what happens. If you breathe in for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and hold for four. Then make your choice on how you'd like to best proceed. This is extremely helpful after you've just hit your first shot out of bounds and you're reached into your bag to grab that next golf ball before you get really angry and fire another one out of bounds. Slow down, take your breath, do your box breath. You'll be able to make a better choice. Maybe you need to change targets. Maybe you need to hit a different golf club. So really helpful for regulating emotions. So when we look at the Masters back in November of 2020, we had the opportunity, a very grave opportunity to see Tiger score a 10 on a par three. And I want you to observe this collection of his shots, his body language, the responses that he had. Did he throw a club? Did he have a temper tantrum? Or did he just kind of look at his caddy, have this internal experience, grab another ball, come up with a new game plan, and go on from there. It was really quite phenomenal to see after him scoring a 10, one of his highest scores in an event, how he recovered with four birdies right after. What a lesson to be sharing to our students that having a big number is not gonna make or break it. Still made a lot of money. He did not win the event. His ego is not tarnished. His reputation is not tarnished. It's a big number. We'll talk about it for a couple of weeks. We'll learn from it. We're going to move on. But what was so neat is the recovery from that experience to come back and fire a couple of birdies. What a great way to finish. His demeanor is so calm. He's using some great emotional regulation techniques to manage the inner experience that he's going through. Great lesson to be learned there. Now, as we go into attention and concentration, shoot, even just watching this webinar live or on demand, your attention might be taxed and hijacked right now. Maybe you look at your phone or you're checking your email. Our attention and concentration is so important because it helps us execute the process when we are performing. Sometimes we're over a shot and our mind gets pulled into the past or we start to think about the future, what might happen by the time we get to the end of our round. And it's so important to train our mind and our body to be present. With the amount of numerous distractions that we experience, whether it's playing partners, emotional experiences, hazards, crowds and spectators, we have to have the mental fortitude to be able to bring ourselves to the present moment and focus on the process at hand. Even the experience of emotions after you're now a little bit more grounded in how to regulate your emotions, that in itself can be a distraction. So if I just scored a 10 on a par three in a major event, I'd feel really, really angry. If I got held up in that anger, my next shot could prevent me from being able to score a birdie or to hit the fairway or to hit my target. So emotions can become distractions. And so a great way to build up our attention and concentration is number one, use of cue words. So create some sort of word or trigger that really just brings you back into the zone. Sometimes people will do it from a physical sense. They might touch their middle finger to their thumb. Okay, now it's time to focus. They might take a deep breath and say, let's go. They might have some sort of command that signifies it's ready, it's time and ready to be focused on this shot at hand. Second, we wanna develop effective routines. So a, pre, a pre shot routine, having a routine for your chips, your putts, your full shots, routines for tournament prep, preparation, 
When you develop a routine, then your mind is less in the future and less in the past, and it's here right now because you need to accomplish the steps of your routine. Make sure you take attention breaks. So if you're having a long range session and you're finding that your mind is starting to deter and go other places, take a little brain break. I always felt that when I was like working on a project on the computer or in Zoom fatigue, we're getting that nowadays, take a little brain break, get up, walk around, grab a drink of water. When you're on the golf course and you're playing in a tournament, think about something else or just kind of like shut your eyes and breathe while someone else is putting, take an attention break because our attention doesn't need to be 100% on the entire event or the entire round of golf. We need to be able to turn it on and off and on and off. That helps us reserve our mental energy and focus when we need to. Next, what is within your locus of control? Like, what do you actually have control over? Well, you don't have control over the cut line. You don't have control over how the field performs, but you do have control over how to move your attention where you want it to, how to regulate your emotions. You have attention over, or you have control over your routines. Lastly, mindfulness. Doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it is a fantastic definition of mindfulness, and that will help your concentration. So if you are eating dinner, you're only eating dinner. You're not eating dinner, responding to emails, and talking on the phone at the same time. When you're taking a shower, you're only taking a shower. You're not thinking about the laundry you need to do or the six things that you have to do as soon as you get out of the shower or who's on your student list today that you're going to teach lessons to. You're taking a shower and you're enjoying the warmth of the water and the smell of the shampoo. So try to practice just doing one thing at one time and knowing that you're doing it in these little bits, and you'll start to notice how your attention becomes stronger and stronger. Next, if you don't have a template to follow, then you have no direction. It is very difficult to perform your best when you don't have a game plan. And if you don't have a game plan, then motivation can start to decrease. And so we see a ton of burnout, especially in our junior golfers who are training all year long because they don't really have a clear plan or maybe the plan that they have is too intense for the age that they are. But if you have a plan for the practice session that you have at hand or a 30 day plan to lower your scoring average, maybe a five year plan to get on tour, a 10 year plan to make 300,000 in your teaching academy, you have then a blueprint to start to follow. You also need to make sure you have a tracking system. So how do you know that you're on track to accomplish your goals if we're not documenting along the way? Now there's some wonderful golf stat programs out there that will allow our students and ourselves as players to be able to figure out how close are we getting to our goals if you're prepping for a particular tournament and you're looking to see where the bleeding occurs on your scorecard and how do I perform better, the stats will give you a very objective point of view on the areas that you need to focus on. And then you can start to build a plan of how do I improve my greens hit and regulation and my proximity to the hole in 90 days. Well, you can start to use some goal setting that are what's considered smart. They're simple, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're realistic and they're timely. So you come up with a really good plan to allow you to continue your progress and your performance. You don't just wing it and show up on the range. We certainly don't want our students to just wing it and, and show up on the range to practice after our, our sessions with them, helping them with their swing. That's why we assign them homework and we assign them some performance plans to work on. So even for you yourself as a professional, whether it's your business or you're playing, we wanna be able to set up goals. Once we have those uh, goals set up and we're trying to perform better on the golf course, because we're not just range players, we're trying to transfer this to the golf course, there's some pretty clear ways for us to do that. And number one is once you feel like you've accomplished a goal, now you need to set a new one, but just make it a little bit harder. So if your goal was to, to drop one shot off of your, your putting average, can you drop another half shot out of your putting average? If your goal is to hit 13 fairways around and you just mastered 13 fairways and you think 14 is unattainable, try to make it 14, make it a little bit more difficult. Once you accomplish the goal, try to go a little bit more tougher. And then let's attain success in ladder increments. Uh, this is great when we're teaching newer golfers. So we start them really close to the hole 
maybe like 50 yards away and then they start to gain some success. So then we make it a little bit more difficult. We move them to 75 yards and then we move them back to 100 yards and then 150. And finally, within a year's time, they might be teeing off from the T sets. So attaining success in those latter increments can really help with that goal setting. And when you're training, you're looking at repeating a movement in order to get it to an automatic phase. And then we're going to challenge it. So once I've learned a mechanic in my golf swing, I want to practice it enough so it becomes automatic, but then I want to challenge it and put it in into a thick rough or really, really tight lie or in between two trees. I want to be able to challenge that to make it a little bit harder. Recreating pressure situations mentally and physically and from an imagery standpoint, which we'll get to next, certainly helps in terms of our goal setting and performance. And then finally, having some on-course practice in adverse scenarios. So not just playing from the middle of the fairway, not just playing from 20 feet from the hole, but throwing that ball off the green, putting it in some tough areas, that helps us really up the performance factor. So it transfers our learning from the range to the golf course. Next, we're gonna get into imagery, visualization, and mental practice. So if you see it in your mind, you will hold it in your hand. It's so amazing how being able to imagine the golf swing that you want will actually run the same neural connections as if you were doing the golf swing live. Mental rehearsals are unbelievable. It is so nice during the time of 2020 and COVID to be able to play golf in my mind when golf courses were closed and then do that for a couple of months and then get back onto the golf course and actually be at the same level, if not a little better. Because when I run things through my mind, it's my brain can't tell whether I'm doing it live and in person or not, because it's running the same neural connections. When you engage in imagery, really mindfully and engage in it, you actually can change your cell biology. There's some really cool studies out there. Um, looking at how the imagery of our body, body, we can start to change the biology. When you're trying to improve your imagery strength, we wanna be able to look at our mental images from a variety of different perspectives. So if I'm looking at improving a particular element of my golf swing, let's say I'm gonna add flexion in my lead wrist at the top of my swing because I really cup it and I'm, I'm struggling with slicing. So I might kind of imagine what my wrist would feel like as I start to get a little bit more flexed at the top. Maybe I do that before I go to bed or when I wake up in the morning, but I look at it from different angles, from the top, down below, from the side. That will allow me to have a really robust image as I'm trying to rehearse. Create an imagery schedule. So if you're pairing for an event, play the golf course in your mind several times. If you're working on a swing mechanic change, do it for 15 minutes in the morning while you're having your coffee or 10 minutes before you go to bed at night. Create a schedule for how often you're going to engage in rehearsing in your brain. It's also really neat to come up with different scenarios and enhance your imagery and kind of add challenge into the imagery, as we mentioned with our goal setting. So if I'm going to play a golf course in my mind, I'm not going to shoot 65, 72 every single time. I'm going to imagine that there's a couple of shots that maybe go into the water and then I recover with an up and down. Or maybe something weird happens where the ball hits the tree and kind of bounces to the right. And then I see myself make an adequate recovery shot back into the fairway. So you have some freedom and flexibility to change the imagery that's applicable for you and to also visualize with enough challenge to get you prepared for performing your best. Next and last, we'll go into our self-talk. Our self-talk is the inner critic, the things that we say in our mind. Those are our beliefs. We call those schemas in psychology. The scripts that run through our mind create a narrative. And then we act out that narrative through our actions. And most of the time it's developed through adolescence, through our interactions with parents and mentors and those around us. And then pretty much formed by the time we get into adulthood, but that does not mean that we can't change them. But our schemas are perpetuated through our behaviors. So if I think that I'm a horrible putter, 
then I might avoid practicing putting. So it shows up in my behavior because my belief system is, well, I'm bad anyway, so why should I go practice? So if it affects our attitudes and our moods and our performance state, then this is an area for you to really tap into with your students and yourself to be able to perform better. What are your schemas? What are your self-talk styles? Um, where do you tend to find you become the most critical of yourself in a particular place in a round? So a nice way to be able to check out what your beliefs are about yourself or even with your students and ha have them do a simple fill in the blank question. I am a blank golfer. I'm a blank driver of the golf ball. I'm a blank punk bunker player. The first word that pops into your mind without any filtering whatsoever will give you a little bit of insight into what your belief is. And I say the first word because sometimes we'll say, oh, I'm a horrible golfer. I mean, I'm, I'm an okay golfer. Like we change it. Okays and goods mean that you're pretty non-committal one way or the other. But if you're like, I'm a horrible golfer, I really feel that. Then we can look at tapping in with the student to be able to reroute that, reframe that, create it a bit more neutral and come up with a game improvement plan to change their belief system or to figure out what's road blocking them, what's causing them to feel like this is the way that they believe it about themselves. Is it something from childhood? Is it something from their past experiences? What happened on the golf course? So this is just a neat way to be able to look at what your belief system so as we look at the different types of fundamentals, you know, we have our grip alignment posture for golf, the fundamentals for physical performance. These are the fundamentals for performance. And if you're able to just get a little bit better in each of these areas, then your performance on the golf course is certainly going to improve. So I want to remind you that if you're watching this live, you will earn as PGA members one MSR credit. And if you're watching this on demand, you will also earn one MSR credit, but you'll have to take a test at the end of watching this video. But you have me as a resource. So if you have any questions whatsoever about the big five of sports psychology, feel free to reach out to me, whether cell phone or email. Feel free to visit my websites, allisonkurtgolf.com or kurtperformancetherapy.com, which is where I house a lot of my sports psychology information as I work with students and clients. And feel free to follow me on social media handles, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It has been a pleasure sharing with you some information about the Big Five in sports psychology to help you perform better in golf. I hope you take some of these fundamentals to your students and pass them along and use them for yourself as well. Thank you so much and look forward to seeing you in person soon.